Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to um, to start the discussion today. Um, I've read um, the book. I've written a review, which should come out in the coming weeks, um, which I'm um, semi happy with. But I mean, it's a positive review. But I just I, I felt I couldn't get um it's quite difficult to write because it was 700 words and the book goes so deep on so many different things and it's, it's really quite broad and um so yeah i i want to um basically i want to start by maybe saying just a few things about the book and that leads me to the first question for aben because it's a the chapter is kind of outside of the book and to some degree and inside in the middle at the same time so i mean the mutant project for those who have not read it i think some might have already seen it but for those who haven't read it it does look at the way we now use genetic medicine or especially the, the whole crispr story that's come up since 2012 and sync fingers and other genome editing tools that came up before that um and it sticks through so many layers i mean at, at the core i think the one thing that stand, stood out to me immediately was kind of the depth of insight it gave us into the story of, um, I will butcher the name, Hei he, he Chung Kui. I can't pronounce hey, it. I just, yeah, you're, you're doing pretty I'll, good. I'll just <laughs> call him JK because that's apparently the name he went by. Um, so these are, this is the story of how he was involved in bringing about Lulu and Nana, the first gene editor babies and all that. And the book just goes into amazing detail, I think, into what was happening behind well within the scene the, the scene that we wouldn't normally see um it goes into jk's laboratory and how people have in the lab have dealt with the ambitions of jk himself and the speed at which progress was being pushed or made um it, even talked to parents on the trial there were many more it was seven who um, in the end took place i think seven couples um, and so that's a really fascinating strand. So it's really just investigative journalism to some degree, just going really deep. And um, this kind of book ends the book. It kind of, it starts with that story and it ends with the story. And in the middle, it kind of opens up and it looks at so many different aspects of genetic technology as it's used in humans at the moment. It doesn't look necessarily at animals or anything. It's really kind of focused on humans. And the book uses HIV as a as a strand to go through these kind of complexities because there were trials in adults before that in 2009 2010 also with gene editing tools slightly different technology but same aim targeting the same protein that JK was targeting to make Lulu and Nana Nana I'm resistant to HIV infection and so Aben talks to you know patient activists who took part in these trials or patients, people who took part in those trials and became activists or were activists before. He goes to DIY biologists who try similar things, who use genome editing tools to modify themselves or others. And he talks to, you know, he looks at how finance comes into this in, on different levels. And what stood out to me was how it's really, Aben calls the book a mosaic portrait at some point, like talking to different people, you know, it kind of, it's all these little bits that come together to give one picture. I think that is part of it. But another important aspect of the book is kind of, it, it bumps you around the whole time. You kind of, you go like, oh, wow, this is what, what JK is doing. This is like crazy. And then it, Aben switches it and he goes like, well, but actually... He has all these nice examples and bringing all these stories together to mesh somehow to show that similar motives or drives work in other fields as well, like the push and the desire to move fast and break things, Shenzhen speed, but also Silicon Valley mottos and kind of how this is all a global culture and really questioning kind of to some degree, I guess, how we could call JK a rogue scientist and kind of he goes, you know, off the, he's like off the charts. No, he's maybe more a product of a global culture of that's developing and so on. So this kind of being bumped around is, is really, is, is really fascinating to me because it, it stops you from drawing clear lines and lines that even I would usually, you know, it's, or any of us probably wouldn't have question and it just suddenly makes you think again. Um, so that is really the main power, um, I think, to me. Um, 
but it brings me to i guess the first question for Aben and that this kind of the piece that we read for this meeting is I was when I read the book, I was like the epilogue came up, I was like, oh wow, I didn't expect that. I really didn't see it coming because, for instance, Donna Hathaway is not mentioned a single time in the whole book. She just doesn't appear. Talk of symbiosis, multi all these things don't come up. And obviously, COVID doesn't come up as well because the book I get, you know, was written before December 2019. But I was just wondering how how did this epilogue was it always the plan to bring in Hathaway at the very end to kind of bring a twist to things? Or was that kind of a move because you, you wanted to connect it to the COVID issue or how did, how did that epilogue shape up actually? So, so for the starters, thank you for such a, a deep and generous in, engagement with, with the text and um, kind of building on um, some of the, the key themes that you've already uh, put out there. I'd love to kind of highlight one of the narrative arcs that you already mentioned. So, so, so the book opens with a scene in Hong Kong of confusion when um, a bunch of people had come together for a summit on, on human genome, gen genome editing to talk about in theory, what should we do with these technologies now that we can use it? And somebody's there sitting on the couch in the hotel who'd just done this experiment. And um, these two babies, Lulu and Nana, are kind of at the center of, of, of this story arc. And um, Along the way, I discovered that the scientists at the center of the story, JK or Jean Kui He, um, he seriously misled the public with these videos he put out on YouTube, making his signature announcement. He, he claimed that these two babies came into the world as healthy as any others, but that had just had a single gene deleted from, from their genome. And I found out that when he recorded those videos, the, the babies were actually uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit of a hospital. So, so I kind of chart that story, but then the chapter that comes right before this is, is one kind of sitting with the parents, not, not just of, of those two babies, but the seven other couples that signed up for his experiment had eggs extracted with IVF, had CRISPR injected into the eggs and had those eggs implanted back into them. And, you know, it, it, that narrative arc kind of resolves itself because the babies, after being released from the hospital, seem to be growing healthy. Um, we don't know at this point, you know, what kinds of long-term consequences of having your genome edited at the embryo stage is going to have for these children. Um, but, you know, at this point, they seem to be more or less growing normally. Um, but perhaps even more um, importantly, you know, at, at the same time that many bioethicists were kind of waving their hands about um, the failings of the informed consent process, I, I discovered that actually the people who signed up for the experiment really did know what was going on. And the chapter right before this kind of resolves that. So as Dr. Huzz put on trial, being sent, you know, sentenced to three year, years in prison, um, the parents are coming to his defense, saying that society's reaction to this experiment is worse than the experiment itself. And they were very much celebrating, you know, this, this person from the innovation economy who was trying to do interesting, socially justified research because living with HIV in China is, involves serious discrimination. So, so these parents, even after the, the controversy, at least some of them who's letters I got to see, they, they made formal testimony to the court as they were um, deciding what ver you know, what sentence to, to give and um, whether he was guilty of committing a, a medical crime. So he was co convicted, but ultimately the parents point out hypocrisy in Chinese society. Why, why, aren't, why isn't more research happening on HIV? So, so I felt like, you know, that story in, in my mind was a little bit too simple to, to just kind of end it and resolve it with okay, the informed consent was legit, like, it's okay. <laughs> and, and I wanted to, and, and the short answer to your question about, you know, did I plan to bring in Haraway kind of at the end um, as I was writing this, like, at, no, I didn't. So I wrote, I wrote that chapter like very much as the pandemic was just happening. Um, you know, Don and I had a number of drafts that we swapped back and forth and extended phone calls as, as the pandemic was just emerging. And, you know, I, I really wanted to address these broader issues in the environmental humanities, but also, you know, feminist histories of biology that are about these cyborg politics, about these, these 
symbiotic arrangements that we might forge with technologies that are born, you know, the, so the cyborg manifesto classically, you know, it's about these informatics of control, these militaristic figures, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, like take, taking that image of the cyborg and refiguring it into something that can do interesting feminist political work. So, you know, this gene editing technology CRISPR that was born of an innovation economy that produced some, you know, profound problems as it emerges in the clinic, you know, what, what kind of feminist politics or some, some, some symbiotic politics, maybe to, to um, reference St Stefan Helmreich a little bit, might we imagine with this tool? And um, also what kinds of problems in genetic thinking might we diagnose with CRISPR? So that's the, in, in part, this, this book is really aiming to deflate the power of the genome <laughs> and to show like, okay, like the promise has arrived. We've been waiting for this since, you know, Watson and Crick stole scientific results from a woman and popularized DNA as the code of life itself. So that moment's arrived. We can change DNA sequences now but it's, it's kind of a, an ambivalent ending, you know, that these babies were sick at birth. We don't know, like, how to evaluate these trade-offs, you know, should I knock out CCR5 in my children? Should I knock out ACE2 to protect myself from, you know, COVID if, if, I, if I could use these tools? And, and I think it's, it's really a story of, of misplaced concreteness and also that spectacle of, of biocapital, you know, Kaushik Sundarajan and many others have, have taught us the ways that um, these logics work uh, uh, about speculation and hope in the biological sciences is, is, is that it's, you know, this economy fueled by, by hype and, and hope. And yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to end it ambivalently to um, also point towards the productive political work and activist work that might be done with these technologies to sort of open open new new symbiotic features so that's a, that's a long-winded answer to your question <laughs> no i mean i think it's 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 very interesting it's one thing i mean you end i mean it's it's already in there in the beginning from the of the book where you kind of you the ambivalence and kind of you you show that you know at the at the Hong Kong summit, for instance, where you where you start the book, um, you show that you know people were disturbed and kind of they were like, oh my god, what is he doing? But then you also show that you know the people of the steering committee, organizing committee, they went to you know to write the response to what's happening, whereas you describe how you all the others were all sitting outside, and it's a lot about you know it, the, the politics of science and society, who's on the inside, who's on the outside, and all that, and obviously in that statement that came out and you highlight that people were not really condemning what was being done that much. You know, the people were saying, yeah, that target, that gene making that change, it's probably a good target, but it was more about the process that was used and all that. And they used the word prudent, you know, a prudent way forward that's been often used. And that brings me to um, the reading we had, um, the, the epilogue that we read, and you end it, and you dare say it's time for prudence, caution, and care. You kind of you 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 know if 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 I found any kind of any kind of direct answer to kind of how how are we going to proceed, how are we going to you know how what are we going to base decisions on? You kind of I felt like you you tried to expand that caution and care. Caution, I assume you you stress it in the book at several times, kind of slowing down, kind of you highlight kind of silicon speed and you know profit thinking driving certain speed going forward um hype and novelty but then also care and with care obviously also brings in um haraway and symbiotic thinking care for others but whenever i mean and this is i, I don't know this is playing devil's advocate or, or whatever but like the symbiosis thing I wonder, I would, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts on it because sometimes I feel in the, in the book and also in the epilogue, I think you talk about the fetish, you say fe the, the fetish of the technology, the shiny new thing. But I'm sometimes wondering whether symbiosis is also fetishized a bit too much maybe because symbiosis to me, to some degree it means, you know, you and I will work together mutually benefiting to, to have higher 
success rate to be better than not to outperform our comp it's a particular reading of evolutionary theory obviously but you know you could you could say symbiosis is not really you know it's, it's a tricky concept and I, I wonder how you I mean do you do you how strongly do you want to link care and symbiotic thinking new symbiotic possibilities how, how how strongly do you want to make that and what's your thinking on this concept so, so in thinking about symbiosis, I'm, I'm thinking, and, and is, this is less in print here, but um, more in emerging ecologies, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking with Isabel Stengers to, um, you know, so she talks about relations of reciprocal capture. And it, as she's introducing that idea, so reciprocal capture is, you know, two entities or agents that become interested in one, one another and, and make transformative changes to their modes of being in, in this dynamic response. And in, in introducing that um, idea, you know, she's um, doing symbiosis in the same breath as like predator-prey relations, um, post-parasite relations, to think about the ambivalences of, of those, those relationships. And, and I think as Haraway is talking about the symbiotic possibilities of HIV, you know, how life becomes possible in the early 90s through these uneasy um, allegiances between the activists that started their struggle in this anti politics of antagonism, but then turned it into this sort of mutual co-optation. You know, that's, that's how I'm thinking about symbi symbiosis, not in any kind of like kumbaya, like everything's going to, everything's going to be awesome for everyone all the time, but, but more thinking with Stingers and Haraway about the discomfort that comes in those entangled relatings. Um, and, and I guess something that's, that's interesting about the Stingers idiom, that's not sort of in the traditional, you know, biological theory of, of symbioses, um, is that these things are dynamic, that, um, you know, while, while agents are engaged in these relations of reciprocal capture, they can escape. Um, it's not always easy. So, and, you know, a lot of relating, r related writing about entanglement is about how when you pull apart, you know, that's when the knots get closer. This is Donald, Donald Moore writing on it. Um, so, so I guess, yeah, I, I guess I'm less trying to celebrate the symbiotic possibilities, but to think about how the political economy of of hope and speculation might be articulated otherwise here, or um, maybe not just otherwise, but like how, you know, the, the book really focuses on that one disease, HIV, as, 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 as you mentioned. And, you know, th this was uh, not a lot of people who sort of just encountered the CRISPR controversy through Lulu and Nana and JK, like have, have that backstory of these earlier generations of HIV positive activists who are, who are struggling, um, you know, and, and hoping for this cure. So, so I guess it's, it's trying to think about how similar kinds of symbiotic struggles, those transforming politics of antagonism to co-optation might happen kind of oriented towards other figures of hope. And, and I think one of the big things that bringing Haraway in at the ending does for me is just kind of remind us, you know, so much is being invested in, in human health and well-being here. And it's health and well-being for an elite minority. And you know, what kinds of risks are we prepared to embrace? Not, not only the question of, of qui bono, who benefits, you know, going back to Susan Lee Starr asking that, you know, it, when species meet, who who benefits, but you know, also who is taking risks and for whom? And Part of what I really like about the Camille stories is that Haraway's asking us to consider taking risks to ourselves, not for our own health and well-being, but sort of for the health and well-being of the whole of Biont, or, or creating new, you know, these new entangled relatings, not only with the butterfly, but but with the salamander, with um, with the kestrel. Um, so so yeah, I, I think it 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 was like that that mosaic. Um, picture that I kind of staged these fragments as in the beginning, um, you know, I, I'm trying to do work of juxtaposition here and, 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 you know, through those jarring transitions, some, some are less jarring than others, but, but to deliberately, you know, you're, you're thinking about one thing in this chapter and now 
it's like kind of a frame shift to to produce perspective on on that that set of values and hopes and aspirations that you were just dwelling within. I see we have like I, I don't want to um, keep asking all the questions. I see we have two questions in the chat. One is about um, kind of just the, the legal battle and what has happened with um, JK and also kind of the involvement of the Chinese government in the research being done. And I mean, the book, again, there, the book is like, I mean, I was like, wow, did, did he check that with lawyers? What he's right, like, you, you're like naming people. And it's like, it's like, I was like, oh my God, okay. So, I mean, do you want to say a few things about that? It's obviously not about COVID or multi-species, but I think it's fascinating in the book. Yeah, so I did go through extensive legal review and it's actually the first time. And, and um, I'd like to actually celebrate the, the trade press for you know St. Martin's. It, it's a very different publishing process than within academic uh, press. And they had a, a very, um, uh, a, an excellent legal team. Um, you know, we're, we're doing this during the pandemic and it's um, a, lot of, a lot of the, uh, the touchy questions involve like, you know, some claims by Gay activists, and you know, this this was this was a gay lawyer who who was really into kind of the subject matter, but also wanting to protect me and protect the publisher from from lawsuits. So yeah, this has all been vetted. Um, so I name a lot of names of of Chinese Communist Party officials involved in this experiment. I, I name a lot of names of of corporations and um, and scientists who were in, involved in the experiment. So to directly answer your question, Lisette, um uh, the trial took place in China, um, and, and one of the remarkable things I found about the trial was that the U.S. collaborators were let off the hook, and this is in the context of an incredible persecution of Chinese American scientists right now by the FBI. There's, there's dozens, hundreds of open investigations right now targeting Chinese Americans for alleged uh, intellectual property theft. Um, so, so in this case, none of the, the American collaborators were, were ever charged with a crime. Um, there was an ethics um, uh, investigation at Rice University. So, so one of Dr. Hu's um, uh, advisors, his PhD advisor, was, was in the room in Shenzhen, China, when the patients, the first patients, were um, brought into the room and consented th through a participant consent process. So Rice University has concluded that there was no ethical misconduct by their faculty member, which I, I think is, is egregious. Um, you know, there was a number of other um, investors and scientists from, from the states involved who um, were not charged with any crimes in China. Um, so the actual, the statutes um, that he violated are kind of complicated. One, one of the laws that Dr. Ha violated was offering fertility medicine to people who are HIV positive. So one of the reasons why it was easy, relatively easy for him to get recruits is that there's no legal route for HIV positive men to um, have either surrogacy or IVF or even a technique called sperm washing, which would reduce the risk of, of their partner contracting HIV. So some people in China engage in medical tourism. They go to places like the United States or, or um, Thailand. Um, but for various participants in this experiment, some of them who were Communist Party officials, some of them were military um, uh, employees, active duty, they couldn't leave the country. So this experiment became the only way for them to, to have a baby. So in my mind, that law wasn't one that should be on the books. Um, he also violated a statute that prohibits planting genetically modified embryos in, in, into a woman for the purposes of pregnancy. But that law doesn't have any criminal penalties and um, it is basically a law targeting re reproductive medicine clinics. So a, a clinic could lose their license uh, if, if they violate that law in China. So, so the statute that they um, ultimately charged him under was something sort of akin to um, medical malpractice or misconduct. So um, he was basically charged of practicing medicine without a license. He was a biophysicist, not, not a medical doctor. He'd never con conducted a clinical trial before, although he was collaborating uh, with, with some clinicians um, who were also charged under the same, same statute. Um, so that kind of answers the, the, the legal questions and um, about the Chinese government. Um, uh, one of the surprising chapters talks about a moment after these uh, twins were born 
when Dr. Ha traveled to Beijing, you know, reaffirming um, his support from high-level party officials, but then traveled to this province called Hainan, um, which is like the Hawaii of, of China. It's like if Hawaii was a, a resort zone for medical tourism. So Dr. Ha was actively in conversation with the provision, provincial government of Hainan about opening up a new uh, CRISPR clinic for fertility medicine that would cater to medical tourists from around the world. Um, this was a massive facility. Um, the plan was to have 100 doctors. I've, I've seen the written proposal and have an account of the meeting from someone who was in the room. Um, so, so there were Beijing officials involved, there were Hainan provincial officials involved, and there was also a, a, a city level official from Shenzhen. And, and Shenzhen is, is a big deal. So Shenzhen is like the Silicon Valley of, um, of China. So someone equivalent to the deputy mayor of Shenzhen was very actively involved in helping plan this experiment and identifying HIV as, as, as the target. Um, I just, I see there are more questions in the chat and this risks a bit bumping back and forth between talk about like JK and gene editing and then back to symbiosis. But I think I'm just gonna go through um, how they popped up rather than thematically. Um, so we have Natalie. Natalie, do you maybe want to um, say something to your question about symbiosis, considering just as a microbiota and viruses? Uh, yes, it's just um, because I am a Berlin scientist and a bioartist as well. And there is something that surprised me because uh, for plant, in fact, we use viruses to induce mutation and to, uh, in fact, to do a GMO class. But in human, uh, well, I didn't uh, read all the book, but just uh, what we have to read. It's just concentrate on uh, human DNA and not really, but if we consider human as a, as a, a symbiosis, as an ecosystem, as the other part of the ecosystem is also important in a way, in uh, also in the, the gene expression, and especially ex for the, uh, the the microbiome and the C the cell T, the T cells, because it's what the, it was about the car, and uh, yes, why um, changing uh, a gene instead of changing the receptor, as that means the educator of the cells. No, mm. what I, uh, I, my question is why um, just looking at the human part of the gene and not the complete and the complete scene, because we have also a lot of genes in the fact uh, working in our body with not Human gene, for sure. Human gene, for sure. So for starters, I'll I'll answer that in the context of what I've written in this book, and and I think you know some of these these people who we might regard as moral pioneers, following Rainer Rapp. So Rainer Rapp was writing about amniocentesis and the new questions that emerged about choice um, in the 1980s and 90s with with new genetic testing technologies. So, so I think some of the moral pioneers in this book are, are these H HIV activists, um, uh, alumni from ACT UP, this, this um, activist organization that went around um, uh, targeting different drug companies and governments, um, insisting that they change how science was done. Um, so, so I think you know a lot of the people in, in that story um, already understand themselves as being genetically modified. In, in addition to having this long legacy of ACT UP activists, you know, volunteering for all kinds of, of risky experiments. You know, I, I asked some of these, these people who are among the, the, the very first edited people, you know, if, if they felt uneasy or uncomfortable about, about this experiment. And, and one of them had told me about getting a thiamus uh, uh, transplant in the early 90s, where they took a fetal tissue and put it into his body. And it was a really bloody experiment. It didn't work. Um, and, and he, he said, you know, compared to that, like this, this experiment was just full of promise and, and hope for him. And, and this idea of becoming genetically modified wasn't that 
radically different, you know, knowing that the HIV virus has re reverse transcriptase and that, you know, his genome now has the HIV virus built into it. Um, in, in the new work that's coming out of this coronavirus multi-species reading group, very much I'm, I'm interested in exploring the, the virome and how, you know, viruses made us who we are, you know, look, comparing human genomes with our close kin, we see there's a lot of viral DNA in, in our genome. So, so yeah, I, I think your your question gets at this point, which is, you know, are, are we that exceptional? You know, I, I think there's there's a lot of ways that human exceptionalism is built into standard configurations of bioethics. There's certain experiments you do on animals, but the human is some somehow the sacred organism, and and I think that all that not only is a problematic ethical framework because it, you know, renders animals in, into this realm where you can do all kinds of violent and invasive things, but but it also disappears that those ecological entanglements that you were just mentioning that that continue to connect us to to ecological communities. I mean, there's there's so many not you know we're, we can talk about the microbiome like the bacteria that have genes and do important metabolic processes. But I don't think much is really known about you know the, the ways that the, the viral uh, the virome is is constantly transforming the human condition. So, you know, I, I see um, maybe what's what's interesting and unique about these adventures with CRISPR is is that human intentionality is part of the equation, and we're we're finding that you know, we really don't understand enough about genomics to, to kind of make good on our intentions. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to be here as an ethnographer for this embryonic moment where those big promises of the 1950s are, are kind of coming un unraveled. Thank you. We have, we have a question first by Soraya and then we have one, we have three questions on extremely central topics of the book as well. The first on biotechnology as the shiny tech tool and what role it plays. And then we have two at least on mutation, mutant project. So let's just first go to Soraya and then we move on, I guess. I think you need to um, unmute, yeah. Okay, Evan, uh, I didn't read your book yet. I have you taught, uh, heard speaking about it, but um, I really love this, uh, this epilogue. And so I, my question goes to this Haraway distinction. You know, this is on page six. She says she draws a sharp contrast between the feminist science fiction, you know, I like the word fiction, that she loves and his profit-driven scheme that endangers vulnerable children. Um, so, you know, so does she really mean fiction? I mean, is that what she loves about her cyborgs? Just an idea of, you know, playing with it and making us understand, you know, and making us understand how these things work and so on? Or is it because, I mean, this butterfly children, I was very taken with the butterfly children because I just liberated um, eight monarchs out of my <laughs> things. So, but I mean, would we be happy really if uh, someone um, put some butterfly genes in, in their children um, instead of HIV something? And then we get butterfly children, uh, so semi butterfly children. I mean, oh, is that, as she said, just a fiction that sort of sort of pushes us to think about certain things. Because otherwise the question comes up, how do you distinguish between the nice projects, right? The good ones that we can subscribe to and the other ones um, which, um, uh, you know, as she says here, driven profit-driven schemes, you know, and how can we, because also all these entertainment things, how can, how can, how can there be a non-profit driven otherwise things in the way our society is built up, right? Where is, where is that place for it? And, you know, how can it not become some commercial thing that will be sold and, you know, advertised and things like that? So, um, yeah, so about the distinction and then about possible decisions about what's good or what is bad kind of interventions. So, so for starters, I rewrote that paragraph and others multiple times in conversation with Donna when she insisted that I got it wrong the first time. So I, I was trying to basically do what you just said and, and take what she was writing about the Camille stories and these science fictions and thinking about how in concrete terms they might translate into 
a genetically modified reality for actual children. You know, there's 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 a, another paragraph in there where from the Camille story, she's talking about how uh, parents should have the right to genetically modify their offspring for, I, I think it's for work, for pleasure. And I think there's a kind of a third clause to that as well. And the, the original way that that sentence was written, it wasn't clear that this was Haraway's own speculative fiction about this intergenerational symbiotic arrangement between humans and caterpillars. And, you know, we, we also had a, you know, Haraway's got this, uh, this idea of lively capital, which, which is actually, and when it first, when she first wrote about that and, and when species meet, I took it to celebrate forms of, of bio capital where commerce and consciousness, ethics and utility are all in play. That's, that's kind of in its original form, formulation. But, you know, as, as we talked in writing this epilogue, I came to realize that, you know, lively capital isn't like, she's not celebrating that at all. She, it's, it's lively, but it's, it's also undead. and <laughs> It's, it's um, destructive and generative. And, it, you know, I, I think it's, and I, you know, as, as I say in this, this epilogue, I'm, I'm a product of, of the Haraway Clifford on a sing Santa Cruz school. And um, I think it is ultimately about you know, exploring these contradictions and exploring these ambivalences. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, as we were working through these things, I, I really struggled to see why it was important to kind of separate, to, to kind of keep, keep the fiction. I mean, it, it was almost as if like there's kind of a utopian gesture taking place here, or, you know, you, if, if we relegate this to the imagined future and, you know, like what, what's, what's the dialectic between the lived world of techno science as it's practiced, as it's, as it's brought into a business model. And, and there's all kinds of companies out there. And, and also like part of what got cut out of the book is, is a, a chapter that's, or a article that's now coming out about this um, group of youngsters that um, come together thousands of them every year in Boston for, for the science fair where they show off their own genetically modified organisms. It's, it's called iGEM. And, um, you know, in this space, you see the utopian idealism of a multitude of young people meet up with this uneasy space of investment capital. And, you know, the FBI is there kind of policing the bounds of, of everyone's imagination. And yeah, I, I guess, how, how do we, you know, I, I, I ultimately as an ethnographer am more faithful to the world as it is, even as I, I think it's really important to, to join with Haraway and others and imagining how it might be. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think we, we kind of have a similar unease sorry, about that, that paragraph and that paragraph is a co-production. So she insisted that, some, that fiction remain part of how I'm reading, reading her work there. I'm, I'm just going to pick, this might be controversial, but I'm going to skip the chronological just because there's one question that actually kind of follows on that, I guess, from Sefki, who has the power or rights to imagine such monstrous transformations. Maybe you want to say quickly just something about your question? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Actually, it's quite inspiring. And um, to quote you from the page uh, 200. Uh, 59, you asked the questions, what kinds of symbiotic possibilities can we imagine? And should we embrace monstrous transformation to humanity that unsettle our very nature? But when I was reading these questions, I also asked to myself and uh, yeah, from multi-species and maybe intergener intergenerational justice perspective, who has the rights to imagine such as monstrous projects? So, so I think we all do. And, you know, this goes to a chapter that features Gregor Wolbring, um, someone um, whose body looks really different than us. Um, so, so Gregor was invited to speak on the first human genome editing summit. Um, he's a biochemist and a theorist of disability um, in Calgary, but travel difficulties and, and te teaching obligations meant that he didn't come, but I, I sat down with him and um, 
his 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 body is a product of a medical accident, and um, his his mother took thalidomide when when she was pregnant, and um, but he insists that he's happy with who he is, and um, you know he's he's got a lot of um, specific equipment that lets him do his biochemical research, and um, you know he's he's a very articulate theorist of, of, of eugenics and, um, you know, disabling treatment. And, you know, rather than kind of point the finger at the company that made thalidomide or, or the doctors that prescribed it as a morning sickness treatment, um, he, he points uh, to society and um, at the ongoing disabling treatment that people like him experience in everyday interactions. And, you know, first he asks, you know, he doesn't have a genetic condition, but he sees, he identifies with people who have congenital um, uh, uh, conditions. And, you know, he asks, will people like me be edited out of existence? But, but also, you know, can we be embraced as part of the new diversity of the human species? So, you know, who gets to count as, in Gould's terms, you know, a hopeful, hopeful monster, you know, a, a novel form of, of, of innovation and diversity, and, you know, which lives are, are targeted for elimination. So, so this theme of eugenics goes throughout the book, and, and it also tries to resist the CRISPR exceptionalism to, to say, you know, to say that there's already many, many technologies in the clinic that are, that are doing the same kinds of eugenic work that some people are dreaming of doing with, with CRISPR. So, so I guess um, society, you know, has the power and rights to imagine these transformations. And, you know, we have a rich archive of science fiction and, and literature and pop culture. And, and I, I engage with this in, in kind of a, a fleeting way, everything from the X-Men to um, more obscure, you know, feminist science fiction, like um, Lies Saltfish Girl and um, um, some, some new Chinese science fiction authors that, that have been writing about um, Chimera and, and other things. So, so I think, you know, in part, I'd like to re-articulate that question and ask kind of who has the power to bring imagined futures into contact with reality. Yeah, exactly. For realization itself, it's also the question, yeah. Yeah, and, and this, this has to do with complicated flows of, pow of power and capital, but also just ubiquitous societal norms and, you know, how, how some norms get relegated to, you know, these, these fantasy realms and others get codified and, and standard scientific practice. Um, I think that allows me to jump back to a question that I jumped over before. So that was Alexandra. And that is um, kind of, she asks about the biotechnology as a shiny high tech tool that distracts us from social political responsibilities or thinking about these problems and kind of a tool of procrastination. Yeah, that, that theme comes up a lot in the book. So, you know, not only in China, but in, in Philadelphia, where, um, you know, some of these, these first edited people emerge, you know, there, Jay Johnson, um, who's at the center of one of my chapters, is, is an African American um, HIV positive healthcare advocate who works for an organization called Action Wellness that is about um, you know, identifying people in the community who don't have access to medicine because of immigration status, gender identity, race, um, and basically making sure that people in that community um, get access. So, you know, these, the innovation economy is producing these very uneven landscapes, um, landscapes marked by um, really rapid gentrification, but also investments in different kinds of infrastructure. So, you know, in Philly, I stayed in Fishtown, um, hypodermic uh, uh, needles were littering the streets, all kinds of potholes. But, you know, here on this other side of town, just 12 minutes away in an Uber was this like magnificent, shiny new architecture where Joe Biden launched the cancer moonshot, where, um, a treatment was found for leukemia that could, a gene therapy that could make um, uh, uh, chemotherapy obsolete. Um, so, so the chapter uh, that I thought about assigning this week that was in dialogue with Caitlin's uh, work um, is, is about just like the pricing of, of these, these um, new treatments. So um, Kim Raya is what it's called. It's from Novartis and it costs uh, 
more than 400,000 US dollars for a single dose. And um, a new therapy after that um, has a $2.1 million price tag for a single dose. So, so I think at the same time, we need to like um, critically think about um, how the innovation economy is working here. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's how to kind of like, as Ruha Benjamin insists, you know, how, how do we ask early and often about um, the ways that, that science and justice might go together? Who are, who are the key people we need to bring to the, to the table together, not only a, after these products are, are, are created, but like as research uh, agendas are, are set into motion? I think the, the, so the question of the inside outside, who do you ask, who is on the in, who is on the out, and I mean that that is the notion of you, you bring up mutants and you know x-men and kind of outcasts and this kind of dynamics stigma like you have like lulu and nana the parents feared of the stigma that their children will encounter whereas those carrying hiv have the stigma it's kind of stigma here stigma there and it's kind of who is accepted and not and that i just mentioned that because we have three questions on mutation and obviously it's a central it's also a key topic obviously for covid19 mutations it carries now we have mink sars cov2 you know from denmark endangering us maybe you know it's kind of it's the the dynamics of mutation so there's a question by um cesar um whether the notion of mutation is being displaced from what was assumed as a random action do you maybe cesar do you want to say one or two things about your question quickly um, yeah, basically, it was kind of a spinning on on this idea that, well, initially, we would think mutation as, as a, a random action. And, but through what, what you're talking is more, so the, if you are going to talk about a mutant project, it's more, the mutation would be more in the not knowing what is it that it actually does, or that the randomness is our lack of knowledge. And that was kind of something that I had in there. And the other thing that kind of bothers me a little bit is that all the, well, the, the things that I have heard so far are more subtraction of elements rather than additions. And paradoxically, that to me seems more dangerous um, precisely because we don't know what is it that a thing is doing. But, and it's more in the, in the line of, of eugenics kind of either subtract people, subtract a gene. Um, so yeah, I would like to hear a bit more about it. Yeah, I think both of those questions just speak to the technical propensities of what CRISPR actually does. Um, so, so what CRISPR does is, is produce targeted mutagenesis, in other words, mutations at a specific site. So it breaks the DNA double helix, and then it relies on the imperfect repair machinery of the cell to basically botch the repair job. So at a given site, that you target for damage, uh, you know, each each time you use CRISPR or other tools like zinc fingers, the damage is going to be different. So there's there's inherent unpredictability impre into how it works, and that's that's where the title comes from. You know, I, I feel like the metaphor of editing implies that this is all too neat. You can type a sentence if you make a mistake, you go back and and correct and refine, but this is a blunt tool. It creates a break and it relies on damage. There's, there's ways that it can be paired with other tools that might lead to more of a cut and paste functionality, or there's a lot of hope and hype about um, a new tool called base, base pair editing. So, so precision editing at a single DNA base pair, but these, these don't work that reliably yet. Um, but I also saw Fred, Fred, Frederick, you had a question about mutation as well. Yes. Um... Uh, first, let me say that uh, I've I've read the whole book except the epilogue, so I'm <laughs> I'm uh, uh, out of touch with the conversation in some parts. But I will have the the answer when I read the epilogue later. And I really enjoy reading the book because it is um it is full of um, suspense um, and and we we travel a lot with you. It's really a global book, um, and and I, I would also say that it's it, it it's the contribution of STS in a kind of journalistic investigation. It, it reads like a, um, a, a very popular science novel, but, but I mean, it's also very pedagogical on what STS have uh, contributed to uh, the reflection on science, right? Uh, I you. really enjoyed it. Um, 
And and yeah, I was I was uh, very struck by the the paragraph on mutation at the beginning of the book when you say that um, it's not about editing, it's about uh, mu mutating. And I I uh, wanted to ask you if you if you wanted to make a kind of culturalist argument about that in saying that in some way, um, so editing is the metaphor of the book of life, which is so uh, Western. And, and, and going to China and seeing, well, as, as you said previously in the discussion, all the discussion, all the debate about consent change when we see it from the perspective of China. And, and, and but, but also, did you have some um, uh, remarks about mutations from the people you interviewed around uh, uh, Dr. He? Uh, uh, and as so I'm thinking of the book, book of mutations of course, which is a, a classical a classic of China, but so I don't want to make it culturalist, of course. But but is is it something that you 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 um, you want to make, and and it also resonates with the current COVID nineteen crisis uh, in what way? Thinking biotechnologies from China um, uh, allows us to to think mutations differently from the Book of Life. Yeah, I, I think I think definitely, you know, it's resonating with the current news cycle and, and the mink farm and, and you know the specter of, of terror that uh, it, it seems like mis misplaced on you know these these novel strains of, of, of coronavirus um, and and yeah it maybe as kind of an oblique response to your question um, one one of the things I really tried to avoid in the book is is what a, a lot of um, scholars in the Asian American uh, uh, studies community have, have identified as techno orientalism. So, an earlier draft, um, you know, very explicitly engaged with some of the, the theorists of of the ways that films like Blade Runner and 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 some some kinds of um, early cyberpunk fiction like um, Snow Crash by by Mel Gibson paint this dystopian. Um, Orient and and I think yeah the the, the figure of the mutant um, has a particular resonance in, in queer culture has a particular resonance as um, kind of the unmarked white space of 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 whiteness kind of gazes at at others and and I I think throughout the book yeah it's it's been trying to you know think think about biological difference with with all these. Um, histories that we inherit, histories of colonialism, histories of pop culture, literary histories. And um, yeah, dig down into the specificity of these particular technocultural moments. Um, so I, I didn't actually hear people associated with the lab or, or the parents talk about mutation as such, like that was one of your direct questions. Um, but yeah, and, and I actually would love to learn more about how to understand mutation in the context of, you know, Chinese popular culture. Yeah, so I might let time. you moderate. We're, we're kind of running out of time, but tons of questions here. Yeah, um, I'm not, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm here for longer, but it's not for me to decide. <laughs> I mean, it's, we, we got three, one more question on um, mutations, the modern symbiosis and another one on notion of cure um maybe just guess, a lightning a lightning round of questions like keep it like 15 to 30 seconds and then i'll tr i'll try to read the chat and if i can't answer by talking I'll, I'll try to write you guys emails yeah let's just give avi quickly the word just quickly hi i think uh my question was sort of dealt with with in relation to the last two um, so I just won't label that and let you carry on with other ones. Okay, good. Uh, Tia, do you want to say? Sure. Um, so yeah, I guess um, I'll just read it out. Um, Stefan mentioned the fetishization of symbiosis as kind of mutualistic in a lot of theory, as kind of this flourishing. Um, and then you were mentioning the thinking that you've been doing via this reading group around viruses and their kind of complex symbiotic mechanics, um, kind of often parasitic or typified as parasitic, but not only. Um, so I was just wondering if you could expand on that, um, this kind of idea of the complexity of viruses in relation to symbiosis and what kinds of thinking you've been doing subsequent to, to the book um, via the reading group, kind of following those trails around um, these kinds of questions of composite, mutual compost composition and 
and the complexities of reflexivity and responsibility. Yeah, just as a quick answer, you know, like I'm finding some of these biotech companies are, are reading Haraway and, you know, they're, they're restless, they're flexible, they're, they're trying to be response able in Har Haraway specific idiom. So, um, yeah, it's, it's such a messy echo chamber. <laughs> and, um, but that's just a super, super short answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, quickly, Mike had a comment or, or a question on kind of the question of rehabilitation or issues of recovery um, with a trial on um, a gene therapy for, for blind or visually impaired. Um, yeah, I think that's maybe more a comment that it's just there is few examples, little material and rehabilitation. Maybe we just quickly switch to Anne Stephanie. Um, do you just want to quick on, on that? The, the deaf yeah. community is having a very similar response. You know, who's going to have a right to reproduce themselves in the future? And in many ways, CRISPR is a technology of self-negation in the reproductive context. You know, disable a gene if, if you don't like an aspect of yourself. But many members of the deaf community very much want to have children like them. And um, Anne, Stephanie, I haven't read your question yet. Do you want to just quickly say something about your the point you want to ask about? Yeah, so just recently I read a book by Deborah Spar. Uh, it's on machines, how they shape our human destiny. And uh, so in which she argues that we make machines and then they make us or we make technology and then it makes us. Uh, so she explains how, for instance, the plow brought about monogamy and uh, we can say that washing machines are in feminism and AI biologically reverse engineering and new assistive reproductive technologies we will bring about whatever is going to come next. So for instance, uh, if uh, in vitro fertilization is going to liberate reproduction from sex, the IVG, which is in vitro gametogenosis, and to my understanding, this is not yet practiced in ART clinics, but still uh, in research labs will dismantle the reproductive structure of heterosexuality. So basically you could have two men having a child, two women having a child, or even four unrelated roommates uh, can have a child. And um, so it is still very early to say, of course, but with regards to CRISPR, uh, what uh, will it uh, usher in and also what kind of safety measures are in place to prevent CRISPR from being misused, such as, for instance, uh, modify human embryos. And I, I, I only read the epilogue. I did not read the, the, the book. Yes, of course. <laughs> so I'm actually going to sidestep that and say that in the book, you also meet robots who are already bringing in AIs that are already bringing human embryos into existence, independent of CRISPR, that there's a morphokinetic database that some of these big companies, um, Vitrolife um, is, is one of them, uh, Cooper Surgical is another, that are already trying to optimize the production of humans. And there's also a moment where I visit a um, facility in Shenzhen, China. So if you read Shelmuth Firestone in the 70s, you know, it's liberation of women um, from the labor of reproduction by any means possible. You meet some, some exhibits uh, where that imaginary is being brought into contact with reality. But yeah, all, all of that that you mentioned is, is in motion and the book answers some of your questions about CRISPR. I pre-ordered and looking forward to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we have one concluding thought. There's, there's more coming in even. Uh, <laughs> Avi had something about the approach to system thinking that comes through in kind of the, the venture capital or the financial markets. I think that's an interesting one. Um, that um, it's rather to make a system change rather than trying to participate in helping a system learn without the planned objective outcome in mind, like this kind of targeted approach that we see in genetic editing a lot now. Um, but that's maybe more a thought than a, a question. Um, the last one, sorry, I haven't read that. Lisette, do you want to say just something about your question? I'm just curious if this research that you did like led you into finding out any behind the scenes information from the multi-species perspective about what's happening in these biotechnology labs and what's being developed. Cause I'm sure that that's a curiosity of yours as well. Yeah, totally. And, and initially I conceived this book uh, as involving a lot of other things like everything from the microbiome to epigenetics to you know the multi-species uh, manifestations of CRISPR but I found that there was so much going on with the clinical applications of CRISPR to humans I just stuck with that 
But um, there's there's one chapter um, called "Look at those muscles, look at that butt," and that's um, that was said by my instructor at the NIH when he was describing a rat that had been uh, 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 the gene for myostatin had been knocked out. So this was a, a massively muscled rat, and he showed us a picture or a video actually of a, a child in Romania with these massive muscles, saying like, "Yeah, we show the basic biology with this rat. We could make you know we." We've made this myostatin knockout rat that has huge muscles, and um, you could do the same. Uh, you know, here's a natural meat, mutant version of that, and we could reproduce that. Um, what he neglected to tell the class is that, um, and I found this out by reading the primary literature, is that if you knock out myostatin in a cow, for example, there's Belgian blue breeds of cattle um, that are also super, super um, stacked. Um, ripped. Um, they have smaller organs. They often have heart trouble. Um, so, so these dreams of optimizing the human species. And, and you know, some, some of this is already happening too, like, like with sports doping. A lot of people are taking risks. You know, they're, they're increasing their endurance, but also increasing the risks of stroke by um, certain kinds of doping. And um, I didn't get any kind of like gotcha hard proof, but um, I talked to one um, sports geneticist who was in the milieu in Shenzhen um, who said that gene doping is basically impossible to detect. So, so we're, this is probably already happening in, in Olympic athletes, probably not from China, he said, but um, probably colleagues in, in Russia is where um, he, he said that they had a better, better Olympic teams to start with. So, um, but, but yeah, it, it, the, the book, um, this, this has been a, a fabulous event. Thank you everybody for um, making my day. And this is kind of a soft launch. I'm doing a, a, a big, like a more public launch on, on Wednesday. Um, but also thank you so much, uh, Stefan, for, for you know, being my interlocutor today and, and also to Rachel for, for running the show behind the scenes. Um, so thanks. <laughs> and Ra Rachel, do you want to say anything about what's, what's happening next week? It's, um, I, I don't have that queued up. Uh, right now. I think you're muted. Yes. Um, actually, we have Nicole uh, Seymour, who I believe. Oh, yes. exciting. Yay. 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 Nicole, would you want to say a couple words about what you'd like I, um, to? Yeah, sorry, I've had my video off. I'm in yoga clothes, so don't look. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, yes, that is my book, but I think I'll probably send, send around something about um, like a critique of eco-sexuality and um, plant daddies and millennials and their plant obsession. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Super excited. Thank you, Nicole. All right. See you, everybody. See you next week. Thanks. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you. Congratulations. Bye. Congratulations.